If only I had it like such and such. Boy, if I had the breaks they had. Boy, if I were only fill in the blank of the demographic that you would like to be or would hope to be. It doesn't matter. You know why it doesn't matter? Because every writing journey is unique. It's different. Writing journeys are not created equal. This episode of Horrible Writing. That will never never work. 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 You can't 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 push that. Seriously? Don't. Don't. Oh my God, that's a good thing. That's bad. You probably should find other hobbies. You ever ever learn how to sell? Stop. Don't bother me. I've seen better than you. Do you really want to do that? And my third grade. Give it up. Welcome to Horrible Writing, the rawest, most candid, in-your-face writing show on the interwebs because none of us have time to suck. Let's do this. Welcome to episode 108 of Horrible Writing. I am your host, Paul Sadin. I hope this finds you well. It is raining. I was almost about to drop an expletive there, but I didn't want an explicit (laughs) label on this episode because this episode is very, very important to me. Definitely. I've been published for a year and two months. My fourth novel was just released. I could drop my fifth one tomorrow if I wanted to, but I'm trying to get my audio book done for that so I can try to actually line up the ebook audiobook and paperback release all at the same time like I planned to do for Rip, which is out now if you want to go find a thriller suspense about a serial killer, uh, hook a brother up, help me out, pick up a copy, that would be great. I <laughs> lost my train of thought uh, with that with that comment because the expletive in, in editing myself sometimes can be that much of a struggle, especially when I am where I am at the moment. What do you mean, Paul? Well, I've got a a few friends who are doing quite well for themselves when it comes to publishing. And you all know, I've talked about it a million times on the show, I dream of being a full-time writer. I work very hard at this. Very hard. I have, well, currently don't have a job still. (laughs) Let's hope that changes pretty soon. But even when I was working the 40 hours a week, I was still doing about 25 to 30 to about 35 to 40 hours a week in creative pursuits as well, at least, at least, right? In that, in some, some weeks, it was much, much more. So essentially, it, at a minimum, working two, two full-time jobs. I'm that serious about making that living because this stuff doesn't happen by accident. Sure. There are some people who write the great novel the first time out, or we think the first time out, and they just knock it out of the park and, you know, they're an overnight success and the rest of their life is set. Good for them. But for the rest of us, that's a pipe dream. Though it is a dream that a lot of us work toward with a few of us who just dream because deep down we're really not in any mood to actually do the work that is required to have that kind of success. But one thing I hear over and over and over, and I know this about myself. Look, when I started Atheist Apocalypse all those years ago, back in 2015, when I was just building the team, if you have no idea what that is, no harm, no foul. I've had it off the air for a while now. But it was a satirical comedy audio drama, so a fiction podcast set in a newsroom, post-apocalypse America, and it's satire, so it was really snarky and sarcastic, and it was a whole lot of fun. But by the second episode of that show, I'd already had the sound producer quit because he was essentially a hobbyist. Even though I laid out the expectations right up front, He didn't believe, he didn't think I was as serious as I was, whatever it is. I'm a very driven person. I'm very focused. That's 
my nature anyway, but joining the military at 17 and then spending 20 some odd years in the military kind of taught me how to lock in on something if I really wanted it. One of the ways that it did it is by me hating my job, hating my life in the military. It wasn't me. I'm a family person. And in case you don't know, the military loves taking its people away from their families. It was not how I wanted to spend a quarter of a century, essentially. And it's definitely not how I envisioned my life turning out. That only stoked my creative fire that much more, which is why you see the Paul that you see today. For those of you who are in the Horrible Writing Writer Support Group on Facebook, if you're not there, why in the world are you not there with us? We're amazing. We're almost at 700 people already. But besides that, the people who know me there, or if you know about my audio fiction podcasts like Subject Found, Who Killed Julie, Diary of a Madman, You, Crown of Thieves, Atheist Apocalypse. Whew, right? And then you stop and you think, well, wait, Paul also has Chasing the Demon, 12 Deaths of Christmas, Novel Idea to Podcast. He just released Rip, and now you're telling me there's a fifth book called The Scales coming out this fall? And he works full-time until his recent unemployment? How in the world does he do it? I can only write a novel in my spare time. I want to be like him. Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. Maybe there's a reason why I'm able to produce like I am. I literally just today was having a text conversation with a podcaster, audio fiction podcaster, who I adore. She's a wonderful, giving, kind human being. She got into audio fiction after being inspired by me when she interviewed me on her writing podcast. And she is, from outside looking in, because I don't know all the details, I know some, but I don't know all the details, far more successful than I've ever been in audio drama. And this is somebody who may or may not have ever joined it had she not interviewed me, and I bit her with the audio drama bug. Who knows? We were talking about She made an admission about uh, not envying, but failing to compare to my productivity when she compared herself to me, which was funny because we were having a conversation about something really cool that might happen for her, and I'm very happy for her, but there is that creative side of me that wonders, when's my break, right? I produce so much, and sure, I'm not the be all end all to writing. I know that, but I know I'm a lot better than a lot of stuff that is out there, especially in audio drama, not her. Okay. I'm talking about something, a lot of shows completely different, uh, but that still get that attention. And I've talked about this before because of demographics, people get that fair break, et cetera, unfair break, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm still comparing. And I had been comparing myself to her and the great things that are about to happen for her And wondering if I'll ever, ever even have the window cracked for me, never mind somebody allowing me to come inside and play, right? Not saying that she didn't earn it, okay? So I just want to be clear for anybody trying to read between lines, stop it. I'm just trying to tell you a story about comparinitis, literally, that I had today about 10 minutes before I came into the studio to record this, which has been planned out forever and a day. And the reason it's been planned out forever and a day is because I keep seeing this stuff, especially in the Horrible Writing Writer Support Group on Facebook. The comments that are being made, and they're not nasty at all. They're not antagonistic. They're more inquisitive. They're curious. They're awed and and set in awe. And I'm here to tell you, I'm here to ask you, please stop doing that to yourself. Do not do that to yourself. No writing journey is equal to another. We all have different things, different responsibilities, different dynamics to our lives. And it's really unfair to try to measure yourself in whatever capacity to someone else. Sure, you know this. But if you're being honest, and if I was a betting man, which I'm not, but if I was, I would bet that you do it that you compare yourself to other people. 
even if it's just a slip, a momentary slip where you look and you do it. Because let's face it, we all know whatever metric you use, there's somebody out there doing better than you at that. That's just the way it is. And it's all relative. But look at life, right? Look at our daily responsibilities. We all have different responsibilities. Could I produce as much as I do if my mother suddenly needed to be cared for? What if my kids weren't as old as they are and I'm changing diapers and cleaning up breakfast because they spilled it all over the place and dressing them because they're too young to dress themselves? What if I have someone in the home with special needs and that is a permanent status where they need that kind of assistance, right? Just that alone, and I don't mean just to minimize it, I'm just saying that one factor alone changes output production. And even if you don't, it can come down to your level of your, something. Literally, you don't have those obligations of literal time taking a three-year-old to the bedroom to get them changed and ready and they're fighting and they're running around and they're screaming and you got to drive over to daycare and the traffic there is horrible, right? That is almost an objective thing that we can measure. But what about those more subjective things like our jobs? Throughout my life, I've been, my productivity has definitely been an, a mirror effect of my occupation. The jobs that I really, really, truly despise, my productivity suffers. The jobs that I don't mind, like the current one I had and I hope to have again, my productivity soars because what I'm spending the majority of my waking hours doing isn't something absolutely horrendous, meaningless, trivial, stressful, a hostile, toxic, all those things, right? You could be a childless couple or a single person with no other person to be responsible for, and still your productivity may suffer because the fact is when you hit that office from nine to five, you can't stand breathing because it's just that unhealthy for you. Those are realities that we need to face. Women are being murdered. A serial killer is on the loose. One reporter with a story to tell. Janice Herring is a pariah in Memphis's media circles. Fired from a television job? She will do anything to get back in the game. When the city's leading newspaper offers her a chance, she finds herself writing the hottest story the city has ever seen. But soon she's fighting on all fronts. Peers are moving in to steal the story. The police unwilling to cooperate. And now a strange man is stalking her. A pattern is developing in a string of murders that has Janice questioning her friends, her family, and even herself. The story of the Memphis murders was going to reestablish her as a preeminent reporter in the city. But with the pressure mounting, will her new boss give her the chance and will the killer give her the time? Rip, the new thriller suspense from me. Pick it up on ebook or paperback or both on Amazon and join the mystery today. So I know I've been saying this a lot this year, but it really is about mindset. I think mindset is so, so, so important and often, so often ignored. Our mindset will dictate how we react to the reality around us, our world, the way we see things. And it's not easy. It is not as easy as saying, oh, I'm just going to not compare myself to others. Because it's still going to happen. You're still going to have that slip. 
You're still going to do it. And it's whether or not you recognize those moments when you do and how you react to that. Some of us do really well with us. Others struggle. It is an individual challenge. But the biggest thing that you can do is to be cognizant of your awareness of your journey. Your journey is your journey. Your goals are yours. My goals are mine. When I give you advice, when I share my experiences here, it is with an air of accountability because this is about being candid. Empowerment through candor. It's about being real. It's about not pulling any punches. I would never disrespect you all enough to give you platitudes. I don't believe in platitudes. I don't need them. They're, they're platitudes for a reason. And I just be, I'm being real with you. And that's how I show I care, is that when I'm being straightforward. For some people, that's a little too much because accountability is a tough thing. But here I'm asking you to be accountable to yourself. What is your mindset? How are you looking at your writing journey? Are you comparing it to other people? Are you at complete peace with where you are and where you're going? And what is your plan for when that fluctuates? Because surely life will throw something at you. The conditions of life change constantly. So are you ready for that moment when they do? Are you prepared to respond, to keep yourself healthy? Be okay with your journey. And if you're not, figure out why you're not. I'm not reaching my goals. Well, have you set them? Uh, In the group, we're often, we're very big on goal setting. We do it weekly for weekly goals. And then once in a while, I'll do a bigger picture post. And then obviously once a year, we'll do those posts as well. But I'm very, it's it's very telling to watch what happens on those posts compared to other writing-centric posts that we have, which will explode. The goals posts do well as far as the number of responses, but the thing is, is that it's always the same people. And with 700 people in the group, there is a whole lot of people who aren't participating or they're not taking the time to sit down and communicate that stuff. Studies show when you write your goals down, you're 70 to 80% more likely to accomplish them because that tangible act, that physical act of writing them out and then having a tangible product As a reminder, I've got it in my mind. Well, again, 70, 80% more effective in goal attainment if you take the time to write them down and post them. Create something physical. Sure, we all have it in our mind, but we've got a lot of stuff in our mind. You know, that theory of seven, you can only actually have seven active things in your mind at one time. And if you've got a life and bills and paychecks and a relationship and all those things, guess where five-year plans fall, right? They often get pushed out. Taking the time to write that stuff down helps you stay focused because you have to be at peace with whatever your writing journey is. And if you're not at peace, then it's on you to figure out why. Nobody else is going to do it for you, folks. We have to do these things for ourselves. Why? To sustain, to enjoy. If you're not enjoying your writing, you're doing something wrong. There's a reason why. Take that step back. Hit the pause button. Even somebody like me, as painful as that is to say, even somebody like me has to hit the pause button from time to time. Take care of yourself. Do right by you so that you can enjoy the trip that you're on. Now, before we get out of here, stay tuned after the credits. Everybody, not just patrons, but everybody's going to get the first chapter of R.I.P., as part of this episode. So if you want to check out a thriller suspense and what Rip is all about to see if you'd be interested in picking it up, hang out. I will warn you that uh, it's adult content. It's got naughty words in it and adult themes and violence. So um, make sure that you don't have any little ears because it's definitely not appropriate for little ears. 
I want to give a shout out to Renzi Lee, who's I'm going to put the advert in this episode as well, so you can hear it. This is how I get the transcripts of the show, so that others can enjoy the content from myself and from my guests who I interview, who can't necessarily listen to podcasts for whatever reason it may be. Having transcripts is an invaluable service that Renzi, Renzi Lee provides. And I want to make sure that if you're thinking about looking for transcripts for your stuff, make sure that you're checking her out. You've got the contact information and you can get in a, that nice conversation with her about her services. If you're appreciating this show and if you appreciate the little bit that I bring into your life, which I hope turns into a lot bit someday, go over and leave a rating and review for it on your favorite podcatcher, please. Those things make a world of difference. And I really, really appreciate those of you who take the time to do it. Go to paulsating.com, click the support tab if you want to support. Even a dollar a month gets you access to a lot of exclusives. They go outside of just a writing how-to podcast. So definitely go over there and think about joining me there as well. I appreciate each and every patron that I have because these things just wouldn't be possible if it weren't for them. Until episode 109, keep being epic. Transcription by Renzi Lee over at Renzi Lee Freelancing. For fast turnaround times on content writing, transcription, and editing services, email Renzi at renziliefreelancing at gmail.com. This has been Horrible Writing, and hopefully after this episode, you suck less than you did at the beginning. I am Paul Sadin, your host, Extraordinaire. You can find me over on the Twitterverse, at Writing Horrible, and over at paulsadin.com forward slash horrible dash writing. Until next time, suck less. Chapter 1 She was being followed. The night was thick with humidity. Memphis's streets shone ink black with wetness. The rain long stopped. Streetlights provided a jaded glow that made spots of pavement look as if they were trying to sparkle, but gave up halfway through the effort. Empty. The victim's heels clicked in an idiosyncratic rhythm, a sign of the damage done from the club she should have left hours ago. She tugged at her too short purple skirt that kept raising up beyond the danger point of her mid-thigh. Inside the club, she felt confident, normal, acceptable, and sexy. Back in the world of adults and businesses, being dressed like this made her feel open and unlike a proper member of the Southern community. This was Memphis, Tennessee, and here, respectable women did not dress that way. This was big truck country, home of the most audacious outdoorsman store on the planet, a glass pyramid rising above the cityscape. This was the birthplace of Graceland, of not only Southern hospitality with a capital S, but also Southern expectations, a place where men were men and women were taught their roles in subtle and designed ways from before their first words. One day she would be free of Memphis's suffocating conservative culture, her true motivation for spending too much time in clubs, but right now, it was the last thing on her mind. The eyes watching her touched her in her most vulnerable places. New section. The person hiding in the alleyway also understood Memphis's culture, and for the briefest moment, they wondered if this woman, whose fate was about to change, understood. Stepping outside the place of entertainment on Beale Street would have reminded her that she was a lady, a mother, and cruising the streets of Memphis in search of a taxi in the early morning was unbecoming of all but the dirtiest of women. In the distance, over by the apartments on Vance Avenue, a dog barked. Its call rose into the early morning as if announcing that even a mangy mutt wanted to draw attention to the fact the woman in purple was a dirty whore. No one answered the animal. Only the occasional sound of a car slicing through puddles filled the night. But the victim still hitched her stride and stepped quicker. The heels she wore, tools of a Jezebel, clicked the concrete sidewalk. Tomorrow, 
the city of Memphis would wake to a new world. Tonight was the overture to the city's violent new beginning. The dirty whore in purple wasn't even first act quality. The killer stepped out from the black alley onto Beale Street, the centerpiece of entertainment and irresponsible joy for the city's sinners. They followed Purple Skirt. They knew her name, and Memphis soon would too. But it wasn't important now. Down Beale Street toward the Robert R. Church Park, passing the Ida B. Wells historical marker, which indicated something significant had once happened in Memphis. Tonight, another entry would be added to that historical list. The victim turned down South 4th Street, her pace picking up, enough to give away her fear. This one was smart. Too smart. Too aware. The legacy couldn't fall before it began. The killer grunted quietly, half in satisfaction, the other half parted by frustration and bloodlust. Time to control. The park was near, only a few hundred feet away, and the victim made the fatal mistake of turning toward it. The killer's chest swelled with urgency, accented by excitement. They knew Purple Skirt would stick to her routine. She always did. They'd planned on the park serving as the opportunity to strike, and now the moment was almost here. The victim's steps stretched as much as her too tight skirt allowed. This was perfect. The trap almost sprung. A few hundred yards deeper into the complete solitude of the park, ensured by the late hour, provided the perfect cover. Emboldened, the killer increased their strides. The victim clutched her purse to her side. Her heels drummed her panic. The killer accelerated into a run. The distance shortened. The sidewalk curved to the left, and so did the victim, heading back toward Beale Street, past the church past a historical marker for the auditorium. The killer sprinted. Purple skirt wouldn't get back to Beale Street. Twenty feet. So close but still too far. And running out of time. Ten feet. Even from behind, the killer heard the victim's exhausted panting. This was fun. Five feet. Almost there. Beale Street loomed. Too many street lamps. Three feet, almost time. Two, the victim cried, no! The killer grinned. A foot. Please! The killer lunged, laying flat as they flew into the victim. The woman in the purple skirt was soft and smelled of decaying cigarette smoke. They crashed into the concrete sidewalk. The killer cushioned by the victim. There was a crack. A bone. The victim's. She rolled, trying to escape, but the sprint around the park had exhausted her, and she didn't have much fight left. The white marble arch announcing the park's name stood sentinel for this life and death struggle. It also marked the edge of the park. They were close to the street. Too close. The work had to be done fast. The legacy needed to be cemented. Yanking the eight-inch Wusthof stainless steel blade free, the rubberized handle gripped in a fist of steel rage. The rubber would ensure it wouldn't slip even after the whore's blood flowed. Down, the victim screamed as a stainless steel penetrated her flesh. Down, purple skirt cried hysterically. This would draw attention. A gloved hand over the victim's mouth muffled her cries. Down, the third stab took the fight out of the woman. Whore, the killer mocked the death of evil. Down. Hey, knock this shit off. A voice, a man's, broke the ecstasy. The killer looked up at a burly figure across the sidewalk and down the street. Thirty yards, only a few seconds to spare. Die, dirty girl. Down. Purple skirt didn't struggle. She didn't cry out. A shrouded whore, bloodied. The killer jumped to their feet, taking another look at the witness, cursing their bad luck and unfinished work. They weren't going to get the time they wanted with this first one, but there would be many more. The park, dominated by two churches of different denominations, provided a sanctuary. 
The killer sprinted between them, through trees and down the sidewalk toward Linden Avenue, remotely aware that the witness was huffing his way to the dead woman in the blackened dress. Blackened to match her soul. 